Uh, we have the privilege of hosting Scott Reitmeyer, Detective Sergeant Scott Reitmeyer from the Burglary Crime Unit at Madison Police Department. Uh, I met Scott at a Coffee with a Cop. I don't know how many of you attend Coffee with a Cop, but it's a great opportunity to learn a lot about uh, safety, public safety, and to actually meet the men and women in our police department. So uh, if you get a chance to attend one of those, please take advantage of it. Uh, Scott, let me turn it right over to you uh, before you get a swig of that coffee. Uh, if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself and then launch into your presentation. Everyone, please mute yourselves if you would, please. How do we get him? I think we are. No, how do we get the speaker? <laughs> He'll come. Okay, hear me okay, Mike? All right, great. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Again, my name is Scott Reitmeyer. I'm the detective sergeant at the burglary crime unit of the police department. Um, I've been in this spot since um, about Labor Day of last year when uh, Deb Plants, who was here before, uh, retired. Uh, prior to that, I have been kind of all over the police department in different ways. I was a police officer in Sioux Falls, South Dakota for just under five years and uh, came back here after the, I was just telling Mike the story of Sergeant Koval or Chief Koval called me every single year until I finally came back and uh, he wooed me back eventually. Um, I spent uh, several years uh, in patrol on the south side, west side, and then uh, I went into the Dane County Narcotics Task Force and I was there for a lot of my career in different roles. I was an undercover officer for two years and then I was a detective there and then um, I came here. So I've been here uh, coming on a year and uh, burglary is a, a, a totally different you know, kind of animal than I've been dealing with before. We've had our um, resource drains like everyone has and the detective division of the police department's kind of especially low lately. We've had our, our turn with that. Um, and then just uh, at the beginning of the summer, our burglary unit took over the chief's, uh, one of the chief's initiatives of um, stolen autos. So in addition to doing burglary, we are the hub for the stolen auto project, which of course is giving us a lot of business lately too. And we'll cover that a little bit. Um, I'm gonna switch to my PowerPoint here. If when it's, when the camera is on me, I'm looking at you all on a huge screen so I can see you a little better. So that's why I'm, my laptop is here and then I'm looking at a big screen. Um, so I'm gonna try, Mike is gonna help me to share my screen and get the right um the right powerpoint up here so do you see the powerpoint mike i see you just you might be muted but i see you a thumbs up maybe means you're good oh yeah perfect everything's okay. good i see go ahead and put it in presentation mode if you would there so you're not seeing it in presentation mode not yet Click the one down there where it uh, looks like a screen right beside the name. There you go. You got it. Good. Okay, great. So yeah, there's me and here we are. Okay. So here's some things I want to discuss today. Uh, if you have questions, um, Mike, I'll let you decide the best way to do that. I'm happy to take questions at any point. Okay. That's fine with me, Scott. Uh, if everyone, if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself and just pop in. Okay. Great, okay. So our little roadmap today, a uh, little discussion of our, um, our burglary crime unit, and then um, some numbers and trends that I pulled yesterday. So pretty fresh stuff for us to talk about. We're gonna go over some different crimes uh, and kind of their definitions, theft, burglary, robbery, so on. What we can all do to avoid being a victim and some what ifs that I thought of that Mike gave me some good suggestions on. And of course, now at the end, whenever, if you have any questions, I'm happy to discuss those. 
So as you see in front of you here, this is the burglary crime unit. We are very happy because we had an ice cream sundae uh, bar that someone made for us. Um, and uh, who doesn't like that? So we are part of the Investigative Services Bureau, which includes the violent crime unit, the sex crimes unit, the drug unit, and us, the burglary crime unit. Um, we have one detective sergeant, me, four detectives. We have an analyst that's an officer rank. We have a pawn administrator who's a civilian. And then we have one volunteer. And I am very happy to say, and she might like this or not, but our volunteer is in the chat room now. Patty, hello. Thank you again for all you do for us. And Patty comes and helps us with um, different tasks and making contact with victims and um, following up on things for us. Um, and unbelievably helpful and awesome. And thank you again, Patty. Um, yeah, so I personally read every single burglary report that comes into the city. Obviously, that's a large part of my time. Um, not only the reports that officers take on the street, but any self reports, anything that comes in from other jurisdictions. So you know, this is a pretty large part of my day. I review everything that comes in and uh, try to find a home for it. So I make assignments to detectives if there is good follow-up to do, if there are good, if there's our evidence or leads that some solvability factors that I take in, and then a bunch of other X factors about, you know, really kind of victims that deserve more of our time or serial pattern burglars or uh, things like that. Again, there's not many of us, so we are kind of um, struggling all the time to decide what what to spend time on. And uh, there's there's certainly more valuable, workable cases than we have time for, um, but we do our best, of course. Um, so, and again, I mentioned um, the chief put out his strategic planning for the summer, which was special focus on stolen autos, shots fired and speeding in the East Wash corridor and, and some other areas. Our part of that has been uh, stolen autos. So we're the, we're the hub of stolen autos. We work with not only my detectives, but then the detectives in each individual district of the city. And um, some of our Intel folks, as well as the uh, gang crime neighborhood abatement team is attached to us. And um, we meet weekly, we have a, a weekly meeting internally within the police department. We also have a weekly meeting countywide with all the different jurisdictions uh, in our area and in the state, not just Dane County, to discuss um, intelligence, stolen auto trends, and um, common cases we're working. Burglary also does special projects initiatives. You know, if we have um, a certain type of crime that's popping up or the citywide in the detective bureau, um, any special initiative we're attached to. And then we do our own operations when we have serial burglars or um, some type of serial crime, uh, we're involved in that. So that's what we do. I'm gonna make this just a little smaller, there we go. So this is some uh, data I had pulled yesterday. So as of, I believe yesterday, probably at midnight the night before, we have had 484 burglaries, 267 in which force was used to gain entry. So not force on the victim or anything like that, but force to gain entry. And you see here, hopefully a uh, map of Madison. This is broken into the police department sectors. So each one of those little blocks is an MPD sector, just the way that we, we chop up the city for um, data and, and call distribution and officer uh, resources and so on. So every, um, every black dot on there is a residential burglary. Every red dot is a non-residential. So non-residential can include a commercial building, um, and so on. And I have some more slides about that as well. But the deepness of the purple or the hue, however you want to say it, is um, the amount of burglaries. So as the color gets lighter, there are more, if that makes sense. So if you look down on the isthmus, you even have a yellow, which is apparently an extremely bright color of purple. 
but on the kind of left side or bottom uh, southern part of the isthmus, you see our downtown areas, which historically have uh, more burglaries, more people packed in, more students, more unlocked doors, uh, things of that type. So that's our, our numbers this far, thus far. So that yellow area, Scott, would be an area where there are a lot of burglaries. Tons of burglaries. Yep, Man. that's right, right on the isthmus. Yep. Um, you know, to the northern half of East Wash, or to the northern north of East Wash, um, down in that kind of uh, James Madison Park into East Wash kind of area. That's okay. It's a, a very hot area. Uh, this is a, kind of a heat map made by one of the analysts about the likelihood of our burglary. So probably not a lot of surprises there. You can see in the darker reds that late Saturday into early Sunday is, um, you know, the um, hottest or warmest kind of likelihood of a burglary occurring. Though a zero hour, is that midnight? Correct. So zero okay. be midnight. So kind of zero to seven, eight, nine, ten 10 a.m. And Keep in mind that um, some of this data can be um, uh, can show the reported time of the burglary. So if you were to say to yourself, a Sunday morning at 8 a.m., why is it so red? That may be the time that that someone who owns a business or has a house discovers the burglary and makes the call. And that's why some of that data may trend a little bit more that way. But you know, you can see that our kind of Tuesday through Thursday, midday, nice and cool. And then as we work into the weekend, you start to get some, some more action. Um, I do have some other graphs, something that's a little more interactive, but I'm gonna just keep moving for now and I'm happy to, to circle back. Mm -hmm. uh, I have here some of the ranked uh, entry points. So if you wanna think to yourself before I go through these, where you think most of these entry points would be on burglaries, and then I, I have them ranked. No big surprise, folks coming through the door. So this is for those 400 some burglaries of this year. Um, either the, the door was the point of entry and I'll get into that, that methodology of that entry in a bit. Garage 146, unknown, you know, understandable if someone makes a report to an officer and they didn't lock their door and it wasn't left open and you know, the officer may not be able to specifically ascertain the point of entry. Windows at 50, balcony six. I have, do not recall anyone coming through the wall or rappelling down from the ceiling, but obviously three of those were captured um, in through the backyard. Um, so those are our main, the, the ways that folks get in. So if you keep that in mind, when you think about what we can all do to make ourselves safer and to secure our property better. Um, we'll uh, talk about that a bit later, of course. And what was I, the purport? What was the portion of those that was forced as opposed I think it was to just two, walking in? 267 out of four some. So okay. just under half. Mm -hmm. The balcony ones, are they, uh, do you, you know what story, what floor? I live on the third floor of apartment. Yeah, you know, I recall a, a recent one uh, of a second floor where there was some shimmying. And also I, re I recall one on Independence Lane not too long ago where a ladder was used to get to the balcony. Um, I would think <laughs> third, third floor would be pretty, pretty okay. Um, I would still lock your slider, but, um, you know, at my house at night, I, I, I sometimes leave the slider open, but I, may, I got a pole for it that's three inches shorter than the gap. And so I can open it up and leave it open a little bit and there's not enough for a person to get through. Um, all right, so I have some numbers and trends here. Locations of burglary. So if you wanna to think to yourself and I'll discuss this funny picture in a minute, but um, some locations of where you think most of our burglaries occur. And these are ranked of course from, from what we have so far. So. No big surprise, out of that 400 some, most are residential or homes. We have restaurants, some type of specialty store, which, you know, a store that doesn't fit into a box the police department has made for data. Um, commercial or office building, or so again, miscellaneous. What I have here is construction sites. So we 
The burglar unit dealt with some real construction site problems earlier in the summer. And a lot of them were this gentleman with the um, the hat on. And I blurred his, uh, his co-defendant's uh, anonymity as the court process continues. But what was kind of funny about this one is that um, this guy got into a store, uh, commercial site, a uh, construction site off of Commercial Avenue and thought it'd be a good idea to steal the surveillance cameras, which was a good idea initially to keep him from being seen. Unfortunately, he put them in his trunk and whenever they connected to Wi-Fi, they started rolling. So he's here pictured in a park selling stolen tools to this guy with the hard face and the camera was close enough to Wi-Fi to connect and begin uploading footage to the construction sites server. So every day, every morning, mom, my detective got an email with the new footage of what this guy was up to and with sound as he sold the tools to someone else. So sometimes we have to get just a little lucky. Too. Uh, and then I kind of lumped to the rest of the kind of smaller ones here. We do get occasional storage facilities like U-Haul or some of these um, store places that uh, someone may cut off a lock or get in there and do a bunch of lockers in one night. Those are, are a little more rare. Um, parking lots and ramps, uh, technically, as we go through the burglary statute here in a bit, we'll see that um, if someone enters a, a dwelling or a residence to commit a crime, it would get sorted as a burglary. So if you live in a lot of these young people live in these very nice kind of high rises downtown and they have um, underground storage garages. Well, if those cars get broken into, those are technically technically considered burglaries because um, the car is located inside a garage. Also, I'm sure as Patty can attest to, a lot of bikes get taken out of these storage, these uh, construction, I'm sorry, parking lots. And those are burglaries that get routed to us too. So we do a lot of that. Uh, department stores, bars, nightclubs, hotels, so forth. So um, how are people getting in is the question, right? So as we all know, locking your door, it will really take care of a lot of these things. But if there is force used, that 267 where force is used, what's the most common uh, tool that we see? So the truth is, of course, everything. So a pry bar, a jack, screwdriver, crowbar, and so on. Uh, the picture here is a really great um, foot impression picture that we got of a door that was kicked in of a burglary of a place on Willie Street. Um, we see a lot of kicked in doors. If we get lucky, we get a really nice uh, impression like this. Um, we have shoes, he has a hundred pairs of shoes. He's about 6'10". I'm sure you saw him in the, the picture that started there. So he loves athletic shoes and he is able, he's our shoe guy. If you get a, an impression like this, you give it to him. On this one, uh, our, our detective, Kristen Henderson, had this case. She walked over to Rod, Detective Johnson, and he said, size nine, Air Force One, Nike. Bam, bam, bam. So he's, he's great with shoes and that can help us really close cases. We've um, done search warrants on houses and seized shoes. We've um, searched different places and taken the shoes. And a lot of times the shoes can really tie some of our cases together. So um, that's a good, good tool for us. What are some of these crimes and how can we kind of um, have a little discussion on the wording? So burglary. Burglary, these are these um, definitions are from the elements of these crimes right out of the, the Wisconsin state statute book. So burglary is when someone intentionally enters the building, dwelling, et cetera, without the owner's consent with the intent to steal. And I have et cetera on there because if you've ever delved into a law book, you know that there are probably dozens of places that can qualify as a building or a dwelling. And over the years, um, those cases have been litigated and there are footnotes to every statute 
Um, we had a case where um, the Home Depot staff for the winter placed a big shipping container in the corner of their lot and then stored snow removal stuff in the shipping container. When someone broke into that and stole all the snowblowers, that was a burglary. Is it really a building? No. A dwelling? No. But a shipping container is one that has been kind of litigated over the years and qualifies as a burglary. So that's what the et cetera is for. The without owner's consent, if you're not familiar with that, that is a part of many Wisconsin statutes for whatever reason, when these were all being drafted, um, those framers decided that uh, the element of the, one of the elements of, of many crimes is that it occurred without the owner's consent. So if you've ever been a victim of burglary or battery or theft or something like that, the police officer always asks you, did you consent for this to happen to you? It's kind of a silly question. We need to, you know, kind of condition the officers to ask it because the response is more often than not, of course not. Why would I give someone consent to steal my stuff? Yep. We, we get it. It's part of the part of the elements of the crime. So for burglary, uh, it is as well. And with intent to steal, it is a felony. I would note that burglary can also be charged if someone enters one of these places without the owner's consent to commit a different felony. So sometimes you will see if someone breaks into a place in order to um, beat up someone in a felony way, they can be charged with burglary. It doesn't have to be just intent to steal. Um, so interesting there. Um, theft is when someone intentionally takes or carries away the movable property. So now something that can be moved, your wallet, your phone, your laptop, uh, again, without the owner's consent, with the intent to permanently deprive the person. So, um, you know, when about last week I was teaching at the academy and we talked about if you live in an apartment building and you cut your finger very badly and you walk out into the hallway and there is your neighbor's bike and you say, my finger's bleeding bad. I'm going to take this bike and drive it to the hospital to get my finger fixed. And I'm bringing the bike back right after. And I'm really sorry, but I was in a pinch. Um, there probably would not be intent to permanently deprive the owner of that item. Um, so the anything less than $2,500 in value is a misdemeanor. Anything over that is a felony. And that amount is uh, dictated by the dollars it takes to repair or replace your item. So if someone steals a tire off your car and it would cost you $300 to replace it, that's a misdemeanor. If they steal the whole car and it's worth $20,000, that's a felony amount. Um, robbery, and we have a lot of folks that um, sometimes swap out robbery and burglary. I was robbed last night, if someone breaks into your house, um, not totally accurate. So robbery is if a suspect with intent to steal takes property from someone by either using force, threatening the eminent use of force or threatening the use of a dangerous weapon, whether or not that weapon is actually seen, you have the felony crime of robbery. So if I come up to Mike with a little knife and I say, give me your wallet or you might get cut and he hands it to me because he is scared of that I will cut him if I don't give him the wallet, a robbery has occurred. Um, the old finger gun under the shirt, stick them up, whether or not there actually is a gun under that shirt. Does the victim have a reasonable belief that there is? That's a robbery. If someone breaks into your house and steals something overnight and you're not aware of it and you find it in the morning, that's a burglary. Um, the other one we deal with commonly is receiving stolen property. And, and we kind of have a joke saying in, burglar, in our burglary unit that the only charge we don't really charge people with is burglary. Um, not true, of course, but receiving stolen property a lot of times is a charge we're able to make stick on someone if they are found holding the proceeds of a burglary, um, whether or not we can actually charge them with proof beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed the burglary, 
they are 100% have this phone, wallet, whatever in their pocket. Um, as you can see, there has to be proof that they knowingly or intentionally did it, um, which can be a small hurdle for us, but um, that's something that we, we are able to charge sometimes more than the burglary itself. So if you would, if you would indulge me a second, here's an example that I just gave to the recruits uh, last week. Last week? Yeah, last Thursday I was there. I was said to them, you were dispatched to a theft at the West Town Mall. Upon arrival, you meet with Benjamin Howard, male Hispanic, 318 of 90. Howard says he was walking in the mall when a white male approached him. Howard tells the male, tells you, the male said, I will cut you if you do not give me your phone. Howard gave the male his phone. I asked of the recruits, uh, what questions would you ask and what crime do you have? So as I opened it up to the room, I was expecting of them to ask, um, did you give consent for your property to be taken? What did this person look like? Height, weight, description. Um, was the knife actually seen or only this threat? If the knife was seen, describe it. If the knife, if the knife was not seen, what made you think he had a knife? Why did you give him the phone? Right. As a as a victim, you may wonder why the officer would ask you this. They're trying to get that language that um, you were afraid. You thought he may cut you. There was an imminent threat to you. Um, and he was gesturing towards his pocket at the time, officer. And I believed if I did not give him the phone, he may harm me. Those are good uh, quotes for the officer to take and taking a victim statement and um, good stuff. And then I asked the recruits what crime we had, and I had hoped they would answer robbery, and I'm sure you did too. So I have um, some things here about what we can all do to avoid being a victim. So this is from a, a flyer that we have and we hand out um, and uh, trying to educate people on what can be done to prevent uh, a burglary to your home or business, and also from your uh, vehicle. So I know we've all heard this before, um, but not all of us are being very vigilant at this, but locking things up, locking up our houses, locking up our cars. The number one way that some of these burglars are getting in is they approach a home that has a vehicle in the driveway, they find it unlocked, and inside they find a garage door opener. They hit the garage door opener and now they're in your garage. And then they try the door into your house. And if they find that open, now they're in the house. So that that is a repeated pattern that we see. Um, we, we try to put out as much education as we can on that, but it, it never fails um, that once a day, or so I read a report where this happened. Not only did they clean your car out, um, they will clean the garage out. And if they can get into the house, um, you know, we've had stories of folks walking downstairs to find someone in the kitchen. We've had, um, they'll grab the key, the other keys to your one car, two car, three cars while they're in there or your laptop or whatever. So locking the vehicle would, would stop that, making sure that the, garage door into your home is locked. Um, good stuff. And we want to secure our valuables. If we have things in the car, we want to put them out of view. We want to make sure they are locked in a place. Um, I don't know if this is on here, but it, I constantly get firearms taken from glove compartments of unlocked cars. It's just what most of us hear that we just kind of roll our eyes and say, Good Lord, what are people thinking? But it, it is a constant trend that we see of folks keeping firearms in cars in the glove compartment. And uh, those guns then get out onto the street and, and are available to do, to do bigger crimes or, or hurt other, other people. Um, so securing those things. Calling 911 if you see suspicious persons. So this doesn't mean call 911 every time you see someone on your block that you haven't seen before, but if we see folks that 
do not belong in the neighborhood. I've officer, I've lived in this home for seven years. I've worked and come home from work at certain times. I go to bed around 10 every night and I take my dog out before bed. And in the entire time I've lived here, I've never seen a vehicle driving at two miles an hour down the street with its lights off with a guy jumping out of the back and walking up to houses and walking back. You know, those victims are a neighborhood people who keep their eyes open and report suspicious things are very valuable neighbors. Um, you know what belongs in your neighborhood and what doesn't. Um, of course, we wanna make sure that we're calling if we see something that could be suspicious and we can articulate what the suspicion is. So what can we do at our homes? Have good lighting, have a security system, of course, but um, cameras are very prolific now, ring cameras or Arlo cameras, or um, not that expensive to get a camera that can see your front door, see your back door. I bought the Costco three pack. Uh, so I have one at the front door, one in the garage and one on the back porch. And uh, all they, so far all they've done is um, capture my kids leaving the garage door open 500 times and the dog running out. But I'm sure that it's prepared to capture malfeasance someday. Um, having good serial numbers and descriptions of your property. You know, it, when an officer comes and you want to say that, and, and, a, and a victim wants to say, my bike is gone and I can, and I'm sure Patty could tell you a hundred stories here. Okay, what's your serial number? No idea. I'm sorry, I don't know, you know. If we can, if we can take a few minutes and write those things down so you have them, um, the store where you bought a certain item often can maintain that, especially in kind of the bike community and culture of Madison. A lot of times these bike shops have the serial numbers available, but also if you have an electronic, an iPad, a lot of times those serial numbers are are on file with wherever you bought them. But the best, the best. Uh, advice really is to do that ahead of time, especially if you're a hunter, you have firearms in your home, um, your, your deer hunting rifle, it comes out once a year. Let's get that, get the serial number off it and keep it in a safe place so that when the officer comes, possibly we have that ready to go. Um, photographs of high value items are great. If you have a special ring or necklace or something that belonged to uh, your grandmother, grandfather, or something that you is a high value item that you that has a special connection to you. Um, take a picture of it and the picture goes in your phone and someday you'll never need it again. But should an officer come, um, you could you could show that to the officer and that helps um, our folks maybe um, connected to a pawn shop uh, transaction or if someone is found with a lot of items and they get tagged into our evidence room and someone at some point is going through those and they say, you know, a lot of times a ring, for instance, would not necessarily have a serial number, but if we had a picture of it, um, we could match that up a lot better. Of course, stowing our firearms securely, gun safes, gun locks, um, you know, be a good neighbor, talk to your neighbors, um, you know, on Friday, I'm taking my crew to a road trip to Yellowstone for two plus weeks um, because my wife and I are gluttons for punishment and we the kids have never fought in Wyoming. So let's try that. Um, but we're going to be gone for, well, let's see, just short of three weeks. So talk to your neighbors, have your mail stopped. We're going to leave the front light on and one light on in the living room. And, you know, my sister's going to come over and uh, check on the place once a week, something like that. If you're gone during the winter, see if you can bribe a neighbor kid to do a quick shoveling so it doesn't look like you're not home. You know, kind of some some tips a lot of us know. Um, and your, your theft from autos, we've mentioned a little bit. Lock it up, get it in the garage if you can. I know our garages are all full of other junk, but if you can get your car in a garage at night, that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big help and get those get those valuables out of the way. Uh, this is the front of that um, flyer, so not not much more information, but um, you know, I think some common sense stuff. Most burglaries are crimes of opportunity. These a lot of times these guys will run down the street and try a bunch of door. They'll try ten doors on a street. If your door is locked and mine isn't, 
they're coming into my place, not yours. So they, and, and they are also very akin to these ring doorbells. Now we've seen lots of burglars approach the front door, see the ring and spin around and, and head right out of there. Um, this is a security home checklist we have. I don't want to go through the whole thing. We don't have a tons of time here. Um, I will pull my contact information up. <laughs> Mike will have it. Um, I'm happy to send anything and everything uh, out. We have all these forms via email. We can have them on our website. Um, if you're interested in a little more information, please let me or Mike know. We'll, we'll get that to you. Um, and, you know, we have some more forms. Lock it, light it, hide it. I have to move you all to read the other side. Remove it, close it, report it. Do you know, and, uh, you know sorry, Scott, if, uh, you know if you still have uh, some of those uh, yard signs, you know, that remind people to uh, take these steps, you know, to block we it, do. light it up? We have lots okay. of them. All righty. Uh, yeah, just provide sign? me. I can, anyone who wants a yard sign, you know, here in the Madison mm -hmm. area, I guess we could try to figure out how to get to one of those. Yeah. And these in Michigan brochures. Let me have I'll those. I can email them easily. I'll give those to anyone. So great. Happy to happy to do that. And I just have our Crime Stoppers tip up here. So one of the uh, things uh, Mike and I had spoke about prior to today: if someone breaks into your house while you are home, what should you do? Okay, we always want to call nine one one if we need help. Um, Ninety nine percent of the time, if someone is home when a burglar breaks in, at the the first notification they have that someone's home, it's a turn and run. Um, but if you if you find yourself in that situation, take yourself to a safe area of your home, exit your home safely if you can. Say you were um, in the kitchen, or I should say in the living room reading when someone came in the garage and you could walk out the front door, call 911. Um, absolutely. I think more to the heart of the question that that um, a lot of folks are wondering about is some of these kind of self-defense um, questions. So I, I've i discussed these types of things with uh, groups before. I always start by saying, I'm not an attorney. This The statute on self-defense is um, dozens of pages. I have pulled just a few um, excerpts here um but uh just for kind of overview's sake um you know we are allowed to defend ourselves um in our homes on the street anywhere um the general uh statutory language is that um if a person feels unlawful interference um, they're allowed to use such force and only the force to overcome that interference. So in more plain language, um, if, uh, if someone was threatening to punch me um, and I was unable to get away from them, um, I could punch them too. It's an oversimplification, but um, kind of force equals force, if that, if that makes sense. Um, it, in a situation of deadly force, so you're talking about some type of force inflicted on someone that has the ability to um, put upon them death or great bodily harm. Um, a, a person, a citizen would need to prove that that such force was necessary to prevent the exact same thing to themselves, if that makes sense. They were in danger of imminent death or great bodily harm. Um, the castle doctrine or something many of us are familiar with that term, um, the Wisconsin kind of portion of defending your uh, home there um, is that the court cannot consider whether you had the opportunity to flee or retreat before you use that. So it's kind of an affirmative beginning should you um, assert that defense at in some type of court hearing. So it's not a, someone steps foot in my house, they're going to meet the business end of a shotgun. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that in a, if there was a court proceeding, the court could not consider uh, an argument that you had an opportunity to get out of there before they use the force. Hopefully that's making sense. 
Um, the person the force was used against must be in the process of unlawfully and forcibly entering the dwelling motorhome or place of business. This is especially um, kind of uh, important to me as a member of the city SWAT team, because if I am coming in saying Madison police and I have assigned that the team and I have a signed search warrant signed by a Dane County judge to search a residence or arrest a person, that person is not able to use this statute and say, um, these guys, these men and women were forcing their way into my home and I had to defend it. Um, that's something where the, uh, a municipal worker with a, a lawful court order, this is not in play there. Um, so I hope that is making sense. Does anyone have any questions about that? That's one that a lot of times folks have quite a bit of follow-up questions on that one. Well, that is a little bit uh, difficult because, you know, if you do have one of these no-knock warrants, right? We've seen that in the news. Uh, somebody breaks in your door, it can be a hard time for people and uh, you might yes. start shooting at the guy coming in. Sure, sure. And, you know, in Madison here, our SWAT team does not do no knock warrants any longer. We're like many things in police work. We've been a national leader in in trends for all kinds of topics, but specifically no knock warrants, which have garnered a lot of attention in across the country over the years. Um, and actually the the governing body that kind of gives SWAT teams advice it's called the National Tactical Officers Association and a group that our team's been involved with for a lot of years came out within the last year and said that no knock warrants are inherently dangerous, not just to officers who are going through the door, but many times to citizens. So prior to that, uh, even prior to that, we were curtailing those. And uh, in Madison here, we are not as a, as a SWAT team in a, in a warrant situation, I'm not talking about a hostage or so on, but a warrant situation, um, Madison police are not walking up, smoking that door and coming through mm -hmm. without uh, announcement of purpose and authority is statutorily really how it, how it is written that we are announcing Madison police search warrant, giving the person a reasonable amount of time to come to the door voluntarily before if there is a breach of the door or unlocking the door or opening an unlocked door, whatever it is. Now there was a, an arrest of a prominent uh, or prolific uh, burglar a week or two ago, right? And that the SWAT team participated in that, right? How did yeah, that so happen? How did I'm that trying happen? To, yeah, we've had, we have, we've had a good couple of weeks. I, um, I'm not sure which one specifically you're referring to. We did do, so SWAT did a search warrant on Cottage Grove Road about a week and a half ago for some um, burglary activity. Um, that was an, is an apartment complex on Cottage Grove Road. So just from, um, I wrote that warrant actually. So our team, I should say our burglary team um, began surveillance in the morning. Um, I did not participate in the SWAT aspect of it due to my, my obligations over here, but the SWAT team moved up, um, surrounded the place, knocked on the door, Madison police with a search warrant. And, uh, if I recall in that case, uh, the woman living there opened the door and the team, you know, took people into custody and, and way more of a low key feel. Um, we did, um, met some members of the SWAT team did participate in an operation with us, with our burglar unit uh, last Friday, last Friday or two Fridays ago, uh, to get a commercial burglar that was in a, a basement on Lafayette street off of East wash. Um, and that was another surround negotiate, call him, his brother called him, his lawyer called him. Eventually he gave up. So SWAT is very often involved. And obviously a lot of members of SWAT are on different parts of the police department. So, um, whether it be burglary or the gang unit or the drug unit, though there are members of SWAT involved in those units already. So a lot of times you have kind of SWAT members at the scene of different things, whether or not it's, it's the whole team. Um, but uh, a lot of those principles are used in, in lots of different operations. I remember a year or so ago, there was a, this happened during the winter. 
some burglars uh, stole a guy's snow snowblower. Right. And that's something you should never do in Wisconsin. Yep. Yep. That's, now, that's that ended like up not being that. very good for the guy who pursued him. Right. That's right. So the yeah. Well, I if I th if I remember it correctly, that's the second snowblower that had been taken from that victim, and her brother, if I recall correctly, was was particularly aggrieved and tailed the burglars away and ended up i believe just straight t-boning them <laughs> in an effort to get them to stop he smashed into them and injured them both pretty badly um so yeah we wouldn't wouldn't suggest that course of action um but uh yeah you're right uh, taking a snowblower in winter is a serious serious offense here if you do follow someone like that, right? I mean, you, like you said, you should call 911 immediately. Right. Right. And if you're saying, well, hey, I'm, I'm right behind this car. He just uh, stole a bunch of stuff out of my uh, car and I've got his license plate, you know, and here we are at such and such a street. But you shouldn't make any sort of attempt to stop the car yourself, right? That's correct. And I, I can tell you from experience that the dispatch center will tell you to stop following them. <laughs> If you get some information <clears throat> that could later be used to follow up um, the dangerous, the possible dangerousness of getting into a confrontation with that person or a chase is not worth uh, your life or your personal safety. Even if you continue following, uh, the officer will tell the dispatcher, have the victim pull over. They've given me the plate now. They've given me a description. We have officers in the area. Um, but I agree with you that making some type of attempted stop is just just not a good safety idea. Okay, thanks, Scott. Yeah. So, does anyone have any questions uh, for me about any of the stuff I've gone through or the uh, anything that, that comes to mind? I have a con. I'm sorry. I it's have a boring. comment. Uh, I live in an apartment. What I did with my, my walk-in closet was I swapped out the, um, the handle for one that I could lock from the inside. So I made a little safe room for myself. Interesting. That's a, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Um, I have a question. Yes, sir. It's sort of in two parts. Um, the charge of burglary or a party to a burglary with an armed robbery enhancement. I understand that is being maybe two or three people were burglarizing a place and all of a sudden the owner walks in and one of them pulls out a knife or a gun or something and that's the, the armed robbery enhancement. Um, number one, is that correct? And number two, if it is, why isn't that two separate charges, one being burglary and the other being armed robbery? Because both of those actions went on. Happens to be at the same place, the same event, but nevertheless, you've got two charges going on there. I agree. Um, you know, there is a, a, sub, uh, a subheading of burglary about being armed, either committing the burglary while armed or arming yourself during the burglary. We've had burglaries where someone discovers a, a gun and begin and steals it. And as they take possession of it, um, they are then doing the armed portion of the burglary statute. And that's a, um, a higher level felony. But I do agree with you and crimes morph all the time, right? Uh, if two guys are uh, pushing each other in front of a bar, that's probably disorderly conduct. When some guy starts swinging, now we have a battery, right? So the, the, the in, in life, in, is that me echoing? Those crimes are crimes are morphing all the time, um, and the police department would be well within reasonableness to refer or make arrests on both charges. Like you're saying, right. there was a burglary. Um, the ante got upped per se when there was a confrontation and a weapon was out. Um, I would say that through my experience with the DA's office, that unless the crimes are vastly different, um, they will charge kind of the worst of the two because it, it contains a higher felony. The person is, has more exposure 
<laughs> you would say to incarceration or a longer term, a stiffer sentence of some type. So in a situation like you're describing, I would say that the district attorney's office would probably pick the nastiest, biggest felony right. and charge it. Um, if there were other things there, Ken, like the, the person, um, three guys come in, one steals your car and leaves. The other one um, does, um, uh, it, in the process of doing the burglary, it turns into the armed robbery. And the third guy decides to punch you a few times. Now I think we're kind of getting a little more variety in the crime. And especially the um, stolen vehicle is not part of what's going on in the house. That should be charged, charged separately and should stand on its own. Um, but it's just right. been my experience that if in a situation where in a, in a small series of events, two or three crimes are committed, unless they're vastly different, the DA would pick the one with the most exposure and charge that one. Even Stop. if one of even if one of the lesser ones, maybe there'd be more of a chance that the person would be charged as opposed to, to the, the, the heaviest. Like a less provable one? Yeah, like say there's a lesser one with a smoking gun. Right. And, and the, the heaviest one is perhaps kind of iffy, you know, they're sure, not really sure. sure. You know, it's, you, it's, yeah, you may be right on the money there. If, there if, if the DA looks at the case and tries to ascertain the feasibility of, the DA is under an obligation to only charge what they feel like they could prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So right. we, get, we get that a lot is if, if we send up something, we know it's a little iffy, but we really like it and that we've worked the heck out of the case and this is as far as it's going to go. We're going to send this up and see what they say. We've had to come back and saying, great case. Thanks for the hard work. They're under, you know, an ethical obligation or, or their, their vows to say, I can't prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. But uh, in your situation, I have seen people or I have seen charges that, um, you know, for example, when I was in the drug unit, I would have, so after I got out of undercover and I was a detective, I had my undercovers going out and, and doing stuff. So I'd buy, I would buy Coke from a guy three or four times. Well, on one of the times, he wore a mask. And even though we know it's him, that yeah. one's not technically as strong as the others, right? But they charged them all. And then when it was plea bargain time, they agreed to drop one or two if he would plead to the other two. The ones they got rid of were the ones the DA didn't love as much. Something. Yeah. Like okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, can mm -hmm. you say, some, say something about um, current status of catalytic converter theft in Madison and which models are getting nailed the most. Absolutely. Um, catalytic converters are kind of a, they're a very tough nut to crack for us because they usually aren't, it's not a burglary. So it's, unless they come into your garage or something. So I'm not seeing that, I'm not seeing all of them along with the other things I see. Um, they also, the really frustrating part about catalytic converters is that they are not individually numbered or marked so mm -hmm. just looking at some of the names we have here if jim or wendy or ken are um, victims of catalytic converter theft and i am driving down the street and pull patty over and she has four catalytic converters in the back of her car which better not be the case patty you're with the good guys <laughs> but if that happens i am not able to say this one is from jim this one is from wendy and that's very important for charging and so uh the other real hurdle we run into is the the scrap metal shops that are taking these a lot of times they're not the biggest friends to the police department and they are taking them in they know darn well they got cut off cars and if they're not making accurate reports or they continue to do business with these folks we really you know there are some there are some ways that police departments across the country have tried to tackle that they've some police departments offer uh for citizens to come into the police department and have their cattle converter individually marked um, by the police department who then keeps a record of that um, but to directly answer your question i would say priuses far and beyond are the most oh. common um victim of cat catalytic converters 
due to the location of it, the ease of getting under it, um, and the ease of identifying the vehicle out in regular society. So if you see a Prius in a parking lot, it's easy to see. And that we have a lot of that with our Kias and Hyundais that we're dealing with with stolen autos too. They're easy to pick mm-hmm. out. Um, I know that Priuses do offer at least some kind of aftermarket product that you can put on your car to try to um, shield it a little bit or guard some type of guard. The best That's practice because of the um, push start that they don't need the fob for. Oh man, I could talk about that for another hour, but that that is. Uh, that is the bane of our existence currently is the Kias and Hyundais that do not need a key to start. That is a huge problem for us. Okay. So, Thank you. I, I, have, a, I have a question. I, I'm a very senior citizen. Do you have any special advice to keep me safe when I'm out and about? I would say be, you know, be aware of your surroundings, Um, you know, go to places that you know, and that you, you know, you, you're aware of what, um, what you're seeing, what, you know, what your goal is in going out and coming home, keep your eyes open around you. Um, If you're going to, you know, target, um, you know, you're, you know, you're going to head out, you know, you're going to park there, you're going to walk from your car, you know, just just keep aware of your surroundings, you know, have your phone with you. Um, If you're, like you said, um, you know, a little older and you want to uh, tell a friend or a a child or a sibling or something like that, what you're going to be doing, if it makes you feel better to say, you know, I'm heading to Target in a little bit, I'll be out a couple hours. You know, if you don't, I'll let you know when I get back. If you haven't heard from me, just give me a call or something like that to just you know, know that someone's, someone's keeping an eye on you. And um, I don't know. The only, reason I, the only reason I ask that is that in the paper, I've seen so many articles lately about uh, elderly people being attacked by younger people, uh, grabbing their purse. So, and, and I'm vulnerable. I mean, the older we get, the more vulnerable we are uh, walking around. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you have a, um, you know, a, a wallet that you can put in a pocket instead of right. carrying a, a bigger purse. Yeah, I stopped taking my purse into the grocery store. I just take my debit card and my shopping list. Sure. Oh, sure. And, and the purse yeah. is secure. It makes me feel sad to think that's what's necessary now, but you know, we, you know, to keep ourselves safe, we want to maximize the, you know, target hardening, make ourselves a harder target or a less attractive target to some of these knuckleheads. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Scott, my name is Preston. I live in McFarland. There are two things that you haven't mentioned that I'd like to throw out there, and you can see if they have any merit. They have to do with home security. Number one, I think it's an excellent idea, in addition to the, to the conventional locks that you have on your exterior home doors, to add deadbolt locks as a second layer of security. And the other thing is, is if you have a garage door opener and you have an attached garage, there's a setting that you can set when you're when you've called it a day, you're not using your cars anymore for the day, so that you can't use a remote anymore to uh, open the garage door, and it'll remain that way until you change the setting back, so that you can use the remote. Good. Both excellent tips, Ross. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, you know I remember when I bought my first house and my dad told me to go get you know, longer screws for the deadbolts, not just the little ones that came with it, like to bury them good in the, in the, in the door frame and to, you know, all, all of the doors in my house have, you know, an extra deadbolt and um, the front door has two, it has a deadbolt. And then way up top, I put up an extra bolt for when my kids were little to make sure no one was sneaking out or sneaking in. Uh, The garage door opener, another great tip. A lot of folks I know also when they come in for the night, depending, I mean, I'm 6'3", so I have a little advantage, but, you know, if you are able to unplug your garage door opener and plug it back in in the morning, or the um, if you have one that's equipped with um, the uh, the feature that Russ mentioned, um, both great tips, Russ, thank you. May I throw something out there as well? Hi, Kim, yes, please. Hi. 
Hi, Detective Bandel. Thanks for doing this. And thanks, Mike, for uh, organizing this. Um, one thing I do, I lock my vehicles. My wife and I both lock our vehicles in the garages. Me too. When, even, at, even when the garage door is closed and our home uh, our is closed. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. If somebody happens to get into the garage somehow, some way, um, at least you have that extra level of security um, because we do keep our garage door openers in the vehicle. Well, mine is integrated into the car, but uh, you know you you feel safe in your garage. But it takes a, a a microsecond to lock that vehicle in your garage as well. I agree. So it's just another layer. I agree completely. Scott, I did have a question uh, here. Are most of these burglaries done by uh, lone actors or are they members of a ring or a gang? Uh, also, uh, are they typically from the same town or area? How often are they uh, out of towners coming into town? And, you know, how would, what would you say about that? Sure. Quick question, Mike. Are you seeing me or are you still seeing the PowerPoint? I see you. Great. Um, uh, very often working in groups, uh, we certainly have kind of the lone wolf folks going around. Um, it is very rare to see someone completely solo. Even if someone comes in, or very often is someone watching the door or the back or letting them down the block, letting them know if the police are coming. Um, if we do have someone that's solo, it's usually kind of the transient wandering down the street, trying all kinds of doors. Um, especially for commercial ones, but more often than not, uh, it's groups, groups of, you know, of course, two, but I mean, three, four, five, the, the, I think the gentleman you were referring to that we took down last Friday, he's part of a group of four, um, working together. Someone pop, we, you know, the video gives us some good tips of how they work. Someone pops the door, turns around and does the raven call or the wolf call and everyone that's been waiting in the bush comes running in and then someone stands by the door the whole time and does a and looks out so very often groups um the for us for those of us that live in madison they're most often madison folks for those of us that live in the suburbs they're very often madison folks so um one of the recent groups that we took down uh we coordinated with Oregon, Fitchburg, Sun Prairie, uh, Edgerton, um, really kind of further out places from Madison that that this crew would go. So our our criminals are moving out to, you know, areas they think may be less protected. In Oregon, where I live, both we have two coffee shops. They both got broke into in the same night by these guys, um, presumably because the um, they believe that a smaller town wouldn't, you know, either wouldn't have good cameras or security or not enough police to come, you know, in a hurry. Um, so they're very, uh, in Madison, there's lots of targets for them, but they venture out quite often. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anyone else, please go ahead. Yeah, I have one quick question. Um, years ago, I lived in a town where the police department would loan out. It was a little program where they would loan you um, one of those, uh, little engravers it looks like a little soldering iron you know and and to mark um you know your stuff uh, i marked my amplifier my tools my sockets that kind of thing with my initials does mpd have that program and um real quick my second question is um is the show law and order pretty genuine Good question. Um, I do believe we have an engraver. It has been a while since I've seen or heard about that. I know when I was a uh, street cop on the south side, this was a while ago. I remember where it was even. It was in the drawer closer to the, the officer exit. So if that's something you or anyone's interested in, get a hold of me and I'll dig, do some digging and see if that's still around. I find law and order to be pretty realistic. Um, the it seems to move very fast like in an hour the crimes committed and the trial occurs which is very quick uh, but they clearly have cops 
cops and and uh, lawyers working on it because a lot of it is is okay. uh, pretty good. Yeah. So it's pretty real, but you don't get your DNA back in like three oh, hours. Do you? Yeah, no, <laughs> we, yeah, that's a, that's a six to eight week minimum. Unless yes. you got a body on the ground, you can make that's it. What I, that's what I thought. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but <laughs> I have a question. Yes, um, I had a piece of artwork taken from my car. I guess it was unlocked, but someone told me if I'd taken a photograph and sent it to the police, that you might have recovered it and been able to return it to me. This happened quite a, oh, three or four years ago and I was just so depressed, upset that I didn't do anything. Um, so are you able to recover property like that? Uh, possibly, um, you know, the, uh, there, the, it's it's a possibility. If you want to send it to me, I'll I'll work on it. I like a challenge. Okay, I'll do that. When you're yeah. working with uh, pawn shops, uh, Scott, how does that work? I mean, what are the laws for these pawn good, shops good uh, so that we can make it easier for you to spot it and for the pawn shops yep. to? So pawn shops, secondhand stores, even the metal uh, metal recycling and stuff, those are governed by city ordinance. So the city of Madison has an ordinance that controls um, certain ways in which they they do their business. And I mentioned in the beginning that I have a civilian um, that works with us in her title, although she does much more than that, is pawn administrator. So she oversees um, compliance issues with the pawn shops. They are required to do certain things. When they take in an item, they must photograph the item. They must photograph and identify the person who's pawning it. And they must keep it in house. They can't turn around and push it out the door the very next day. They have to keep it for X number of days and they have to upload it to a system. So my, my pawn administrator has access to the system. I do and many officers do that um, has the description as much as can be of any item that is uh, pawned or sold in one of the shops that's governed by the ordinance. So if it's a, a cell phone, it has the description of the phone, a picture of the phone, the serial number, and so on. That will trigger a stolen item if a stolen item has been reported. And a lot of the, the stuff I give, I ask Patty to do is someone uh, reports a bike stolen, they give us the serial number, it goes into the system, and someone then tries to pawn that bike and we're notified of it. The bike is still at the shop because it can't turn around and go out the door for 30 or 45 days. We're allowed to put a hold on that electronically and let the store know this item is stolen. Don't let it back out the door. And then we can uh, download everything about the transaction, the person's picture, the ID they provided, things like that. Good, good leads for, for the case. And at a minimum, we can get the item back to the person. Like, like Judith mentioned, if we, at a minimum, we can get them their stuff back there. It can be frustrating for us sometimes not to charge or arrest someone because there's just not enough evidence. But around here, we are always feeling good about at least getting the person their stuff back. If it's a, a, a piece of artwork like Judith, so it's obviously important to her. People have bikes that are they've built or they've added their own accessories or they have a special trip that's connected to the bike. At least we can get their stuff back, and um, you know, maybe forward some kind of some kind of charge on the person. But if not, you know, at least people are victims are getting their stuff back. Yeah, you know, um, there has got to be a group or at least one person that goes through our neighborhood like regularly, and they. Yeah, they'll check the cards. I, my husband, he hasn't locked his car all the time. He's had uh, like four hundred dollars worth of silver stolen, and then he had <laughs> money that he had in the car stolen. He should have locked the car. But what I'm saying is, there seems to be a regular person or group that patrol goes around our neighborhood and finds unlocked cars and take stuff. So do you know about a group like that? 
Well, I'm, you know, I'm on a little probably saddened to say that it could be more than one group. Um, you know, maybe I'm not sure where you live. If you live in a, a high, you know, trafficked area, or if you live in a kind of a main part of the city, but um, it would not be, it would not be out of the realm of possibility that, you know, someone feels like they've had success in your neighborhood or tell their friends or these groups can talk amongst each other and say, you know, we, um, you got to go over to the east side. They don't lock a darn thing over there or something like that. You know, it's possible that you do are going to see that repeat business. You know, we certainly have our group of like regulars that they get locked up, then they get out. Some of them get locked up. You know, if we have juvenile offenders, they go up to that Lincoln Hills facility and they're there for 30 days and then they're back. And so there is a lot of, unfortunately, repeat business and repeat offenders. And, you know, if, if you got a real chatty criminal in the group that happened to tell his or her buddies about your neighborhood, it is possible it could be the same folks, but it, it definitely wouldn't be someone we could say this group goes to this area and works it all the time. It's just, unfortunately, too, too many of those types of folks. Okay. Yeah. You know, we live off Schrader Road and there it's a mixed um, community, like people down the road from us, they're in renting area and they're getting evicted and the population is changing. So that's, that's difficult because it's hard to keep track of your neighbors. It's changing all the time. And then on the other side, it's, I want to say upper middle class houses. Um, and people do try to keep their lights on and be aware of things, but it's, there's still people coming through, opening cars and getting stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the city, you know, when I was growing up, I don't feel like it happened as much or I didn't hear about it at least, but it's a very regular part of our lives now here. And so, you know, as citizens and victims, we have to adapt to and lock things up better and get things lit up better. And um, yeah. If people uh, wanted, it's got one of these uh, hey neighbor signs reminding people to lock up, turn on their lights, and uh, remove valuables from their car. Uh, could they just drop in at the uh, Midtown station and uh, pick one up? I believe so. Let me double check uh, with Sam, who sits at the front desk here, that that's okay. that that's cool, um, and I can let you know, and you can send it out. And I I know where a stash of these are. Let me just confirm with Sam that that's cool. Okay. And if people wanted, you know, I put my information in the chat. If people have uh, want to hit me directly or hit you, or I'll let you know if that's a good good option too. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right, one last chance. Anyone else? Um, I've got a quick question for, I see there's a number of women on this um, meeting and this happened to me several years ago in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I attended a, a event like this where I remember the police recommended that women lock their purse in their trunk. So I did that. I was um, going to a lake to walk around the lake and locked my purse in the trunk and looked around. I didn't think anyone saw me do it, but obviously somebody did and got into the car by breaking the window. And uh, unfortunately there was a great amount of cash and a, a whole new set of checks and my house keys. So we had my address, my house keys, you know, the whole works. And I spent at least three months afterwards dealing with forged checks, you know, oh. and it was a nightmare. So um, I don't know. I mean, I still go do activities and I very careful, but I still lock my purse in my trunk because I don't know what else to do. So what's the current current recommendation that women that that's OK to do or not? Yeah, I I mean, I don't uh, I haven't been saying that one i think it's as good of idea as any um you know sounds like you got incredibly unlucky there that some clown happened to be watching at the same 
minutes you were getting out and maybe he or she thought this person's putting a lot of work into securing that purse. Maybe this is worth trying to go get, which I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, I think that's as good as any, you know, if you, um, I don't know what your situation was, if you needed to take that cash somewhere after your walk, if there's something you can leave home when you're, if you're going to do something that doesn't require that item or, you know, checks, checks are not as pervasive in society as they used to be. And stores are a little more, I think, aware of accepting checks without ID. But I think the trunk is not, not a bad idea. It's as good as any. I think it would keep, you know, if someone hadn't seen that, I think even if they came and peeked in your car and considered breaking in, I don't think they would do it just to pop your trunk. There's almost nothing in trunks nowadays anymore. So um, I'm sure you had a very lucky streak after that unlucky streak, but, or I hope you did. Maybe it was the mega millions. Maybe that will be your night, Friday night, not last night, but. Well, the only reason I feel safe doing it now is the, um, the lever that pulls the trunk open is that connection somehow got broken. Oh. And so <laughs> I, I, it, it's kind of funny to think if somebody tries to break a window to get into my trunk, they won't be able to now. <laughs> right. But right. You know, anyway, I just, I was just wondering because women, you know, maybe, maybe it is smarter nowadays. Somebody mentioned they only take their driver's license and credit card, you know, uh, in, you know, instead of a whole purse and which would have, you know, other valuables in it, especially checks. That was really awful to have, you know, to deal with forged checks. And yeah, amazingly a with a, a very ethnic name, uh, eventually I did get word that the person was um, tracked down and had absolutely a different race and uh, ethnicity name <laughs> than mine. So it, and, you know, being a, a petite female, I mean, it, like you said, they don't always check IDs apparently when they, uh, people come in with checks yeah yeah thank you yeah i just i just had one comment um uh, thank you for helping present this and thanks mike for gathering these people together i would like any and all attachments including a video of this uh, presentation to share with family friends if possible so anything that you can forward on uh to current uh, people on this uh, uh, Zoom link, please, please do so. Absolutely. Sure, I'll have this uh, up on our Triads of Dane County YouTube channel. Just search for that, Triads of Dane County YouTube, and uh, it'll be up there in a couple of days. It's real easy. I mark it with bookmarks so you can go directly to the item you're interested in. You don't have to watch the whole hour to find a particular question or topic. Anything else, everyone? Feel free. I just nope. want to say thank you very much for, for this program. And I, I also want to say that I grew up in the Bronx. I came here in 1963 and was stunned that people didn't lock their doors and, and weren't as careful as I had learned to be when I grew up. But now it's sort of like the Bronx has come to Madison. And I find that very sad. Me too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Very okay, much. I've got I've got one more comment here. Is um or a question really? I like to walk. How do I protect my? I mean, I walk up to Greenway Station because I live real near there, and it's always kind of it's in the back of my mind to be afraid, and I was never like that. So what else can I? What can I do to protect myself? Well, I wish you didn't have to feel that way. And I'm not, you know, I don't want to give a presentation of doom and gloom either. Madison is still a great place to live and work. I have, I'm here. My kids are here. I'm not scared, you know, to go to the farmer's market or a concert on the square, anything like that. Um, you know, I think it's more an awareness of your surroundings and keep your eyes open. You know, I, I, if I, if you've ever driven downtown and with Midtown, if I'm go downtown to the Central District and I'm coming back to the Mid District, I drive through campus and I'm always surprised that people will cross the street with earbuds in where they can't 
hear anything, anyone behind them, beside them, a car coming at them, you know, um, so they're just not aware of their surroundings. And, and so I would say that that's really the number one thing. If you were, you know, wonderful, go for a walk that it's great. This is a great place to live and work and hang out. Um, but if you see something that doesn't seem right, you know, have your phone with you and walk the other way. And, you know, it would not be crazy for you to have a, you know, a pepper spray on your keychain in case you were to run into trouble or, you know, have your phone with you. Or like I was talking about with, um, you know, I think with Susan, let someone know where you're going to be and when you're coming back or walk with your friends or um, I don't want, I don't want to paint the picture that, you know, we should all stay locked up in our houses and, because of what's going on but i think if we're you're keeping your eyes and ears open you'll do you'll you'll have a much you know better chance of seeing anything you know on the one in a hundred chance that it happens on your walk all righty well we're uh past uh, our hour here and we had a fantastic discussion thank you so much scott really appreciate all this great information and thank you yeah, everyone yeah. for attending. Remember, I'll have it on the Triads of Dane County YouTube in a couple of days. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank, thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.